Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, for the last great talk of uh, track one today, um, go ahead and get it started. Uh, so today, I want to talk about the fundamentals of continuous software design, and we'll we'll talk about why I think this is a why I think it's an important talk, but why I think it's important now. Uh, so let's start just a tiny bit, just to just to introduce myself. So I'm Jeremy Miller. Uh, I'm a senior architect at Calavista Software in Austin, Texas. I have been working mostly with agile practices since 2003. Um, before that, I was in the, the the bad, bad old world of pure uh, waterfall development a little bit since. So you definitely tell say. I want to say there's something worth saving and preserving about the best of agile software development. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, if you want to reach me later, um, I do write occasionally at my blog, jeremydmiller.com, but mostly you can follow me on Twitter, Jeremy D. Miller, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So getting started, a lot of the, the, the techniques, just the ideas we're going to talk about here today. There's not going to be a lot of prescriptive advice of use this pattern, use this technology, do exactly these steps and it'll work. What we want to talk about today is a lot of the thinking about how you solve software design problems and when you solve design patterns. But what we're looking at right now, all these things we're going to talk about, these are things that I came into contact through uh, my experiences with extreme programming, either reading about it, getting to work in an early shop that was an early adopter of extreme programming for a little while. So the picture here, uh, for those of you who are maybe not of my generation, this is the, the original Scooby-Doo game. This is my favorite cartoon as a, as a very small child. Saturday mornings were all about Scooby-Doo after school. This was my favorite thing. We had a good thing going on. But a little bit later, this guy showed up, and when he showed up, this is Scrappy-Doo, uh, one of the most hated cartoon characters of my generation's time. Um, I'm not really bashing necessarily on Scrum, but when Scrum swept in, Scrum is almost entirely about software uh, project management, performative ceremonies. You do stand-ups, you do sprint reviews, you do sprint planning, how do you estimate software? All those things are valuable things, but it potentially left a lot of things behind in terms of engineering practices. Engineering practices, processes, continuous integration, testing, all the things you needed to do to make that kind of iterative software development that's implied by the Scrum project management, how to make that all safe. So that's what I wanna do right here is go back and look at some of these very valuable ideas and make sure they come forward in, into the new world or now some of you are, are saying to yourself i'm already i'm already successful at scrum and i'm not denying that some of you are hopefully are already being very successful at it and if you are being successful at scrum it's likely that you have some kind of solid engineering practice foundation uh, such as the ones that i'm hopefully we're going to talk about today and you're already doing these things but for everybody else, if you think agile software development just means being dragged into stand-up meetings and being yelled at every two weeks for miss, missed uh, uh, deadlines, let, let's talk about some new stuff. And if you're also out there saying, I like Scrappy-Doo, I don't know what to tell you. So <clears throat> the biggest differences about agile software development as compared to the older waterfall kind of techniques uh, from a more of a business angle. What we're trying to do is, or we're saying here is the only thing that actually matters in the end is working software, not intermediate design specifications, not requirements, specs, not any kind of process artifact. The only thing that matters is software that works, that's in production, that provides some kind of business value. So that, that's important. The second thing, if we say that the only thing that matters is working software, <clears throat> and we're going to take this approach of working incrementally, one of the things we were taught in the early days of Agile is we need to schedule our project based on what the highest priority business features are. We don't necessarily work on what's convenient for us. We work on 
what is valuable to the business, we do that fast. We do not do uh, nice to do second. We don't necessarily take into account what is convenient for us, the developers, to build first. When I started in the industry, the um, software development as construction metaphor was very popular. And the idea back then was you kind of naturally started with, I'm going to design the incomplete entire database. And then I'm going to design the data access layer. And I'm going to build the middle tier. And finally, I'm going to put the UI on top of that, that foundation that I built. And I work layer by layer by layer until it's done. Okay. What's problem with that? What's problematic with that is you have a good chance of failing completely. As opposed to an agile technique, let's say we get six months into a project, we hit what is supposed to be the theoretical scheduled completion for the entire project. If I'm working an agile project, say we're supposed to build 10 features, hopefully we have if we have five features completely ready to deploy, we've only half succeeded or half failed, depending on how you would look at that. If we were doing it in an old fashioned waterfall style where we spent all that time building up a data access layer and database and all this infrastructure up front, but we don't necessarily have any features whatsoever that could be deployed, we have definitely failed completely. So that's something to think about when you, you fit, when you talk about why are we using Agile, it's not that sexy, but it's a possibility of failing partially instead of failing completely, okay? And then the last bullet point there, we wanna be continuously delivering features. So what, what this means is we need to be building our software in such a way and our practices and our, our project automation in such a way that we can continue to efficiently deliver more features or changes or extensions to a system over time. That, that idea that, well, let's go do a whole bunch of things while the hood is up on, on the car of our, our software, that we want that to go away. We want it to be just as efficient to add a new feature at a later time as it would be if we're working on it right now so that our business can be very flexible and they can get the most important things first rather than just what happens to be convenient for the development team. All right, let's see how this one goes. Uh, let me take a drink before I try to pronounce this. So um, for all of us who had to read the Odyssey in high school or college, um, think about being between Scylla and Charybdis. On one side, we're trying to get our boat, boat on our long journey home. And on one side, there's a giant monster, which in reality is just a set of reefs somewhere in the Mediterranean. On the other side is a giant whirlpool. The only way we get through this is to go right through the middle. So the biggest software design failures I've seen in my career, and, and I would guess that a lot of you have similar experiences. They fall into two categories. The systems where there was absolutely no upfront design whatsoever, and they just kind of grew organically. Um, comes a ball of mud very quickly, kind of falls apart under its own complexity. Differently bad, systems where people try to design everything up front and just happen to pick the wrong design but they didn't turn around. Or even more cruelly, they picked a design and an architecture up front that worked very well for the initial use cases of the system. But as the system grew into something else, they still kept going with that initial architecture that no longer makes sense. Okay? One way or another, there's an opportunity to thread the needle, to come right through the middle of this channel and to be working in a little bit different way. And that's what we're gonna to go to next. So, in the extreme programming days, people started to talk about the idea of changing away from big upfront design, but still being very disciplined. Um, there's a couple earlier names that I don't care for. Um, you could call it evolutionary design or emergent design. Um, I especially don't like the term emergent design because it makes it sounds like 
if we look over to the left, I don't know how well this comes across in the resolution. But this is a famous statue of the goddess Athena popping out fully formed from Zeus's forehead, all completely ready to go. That's not how software design is really going to work. You are going to work chaotically for 10 weeks and then magically on week 11, poop. There, there it is, pop. There's the exact architecture we're supposed to use. It just doesn't happen that way. You're thinking a little bit up front. You're thinking every day. You're constantly challenging your architecture. You are considering with your teammates and collaborators what might you need to do in the future so there aren't any surprises when you get there, hopefully. Okay. Uh, to pull this off and to enable this kind of idea of continuous delivery, of always run, always delivering vertical pipes of features that have everything they need to succeed. It does require a high degree of, of discipline. It's not working willy-nilly. You're not being sloppy if you're not just necessarily writing a lot of documentation. The last bullet point, it's about reacting to feedback. Pay attention to what's happening. What do you see? If something is becoming high friction to work with, maybe you need to change. If something is becoming slower, uh, too slow to meet, meet your, your SLAs about performance, you may need to go in and make changes. But the only way you're going to know those things is if you have a lot of solid feedback back cycles. Um, feedback cycles in this case being things like, like automated testing, maybe you're running static code analysis to pick up things like psychomatic complexity, maybe you're measuring the performance of your system, um, maybe you're just even getting this, this system in front of your users as often as possible. But the more feedback cycles you have that tell you when things are going wrong or just teaching you about how your system is working, the more likely you are going to be to succeed with this idea of continuous design. So in the early days of Agile, and especially with extreme programming, because it had the word extreme in it, uh, a lot of the detractors of, of Agile kind of very rightly called out, this isn't going to work. This is going to be complete chaos if you don't have all those very disciplined feedback loops in to make this all work, that it's all a set of reinforcing practices that all have to be in place. And maybe that's a very fair assessment. But my answer is just, okay, so make sure you have those feedback cycles. Moving on. So talking about just the design goals uh, of what you're trying to get to. Uh, and a lot of these design goals, this matches up very well with what we thought good design was even before Agile popped up. Um, probably a little bit, bit miss. Order's probably a little bit wrong, sorry. Cohesion and coupling. We want any piece of code to have um, a cohesive self-contained purpose. It does one thing. It does data access. It does a certain set of business rules. And it doesn't do more than one co consistent, cohesive thing. Um, we want the pieces of the software to be very modular. We want unrelated things to be decoupled from each other. I want to, in the case of the, the software system I'm working on right now, we have a set of systems for gathering survey data, and we have other subsystems for exporting data to Excel. I want those two pieces of code that aren't really very closely related at all. I want to be able to have those completely decoupled from each other so I can work on one thing at a time and have much less risk of breaking both of them when I work on one or the other. So that also gets into to being isolated. Top one there, uh, you'll hear this called the dry principle um, in extreme programming. Another way of saying it is just something should be expressed once and only once in the software. What we're really getting at is any kind of business rule, any statement about how things should work, um, a meaningful value. Um, I have a piece of... Uh, piece of software that's really bad right now that uses the string, uh, the MIME type for JSON, which is application slash JSON. That's scattered all over the application. And it's probably likely that I'm eventually going to have a bug because I'm going to mistype that, that string somewhere. I really need to go in and introduce a constant for that string value and just reuse that constant everywhere. 
other places, this could be things like business rules or how you interpret the meaning of some data in the database. Um, if that logic is not is duplicated, it's going to be harder for you to change what that logic should be later. But if it's only gathered up in one place, you know, one, you know where to go find it. And then two, if you need to change it, which you frequently do, you only need to change it in one place. So these are all important goals. These are all pretty consistent with what we thought good design was before Agile. It's really what we think good design is even years after Agile has probably lost a lot of its, a lot of its shine. So one of the things, a couple of couple incidents made me interested in coming back to all this content and starting to talk about it again. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working with one of the tech leads at my then employer, and we were trying to decide what to do in, in a particular use case. And I think at the time, you know, we were discussing whether some little piece of, of complicated infrastructure. Um, do we need to add something for an edge case? And I, I finally said, hey, you know what? Look, look, I, I'm going to call Yagni on this. And he had no earthly idea what I was talking about. So let's talk about Yagni. Um, so when I'm designing features, and again, this idea of continuous delivery, I, us as a team, we want to keep delivering something that can go into place. So let's talk about pull versus push. And what I mean here is in that kind of older idea of the, the software development as construction metaphor, I'm looking at a system. And when I'm trying to build specs or trying to build ideas of what the system is going to be like, I'm trying to figure out what is all the necessary infrastructure that's going to be needed for the system. And then I want to go try to build up all that infrastructure very early on in the application. I'm going to put together the data access layer and the database design, and we're going to build on top like it's, it really is construction. That's push. You're trying to decide what needs to be done for, for later and build it now. Uh, another way to think about this, um, for building APIs inside of an enterprise architecture where you may be building APIs that are going to be used by by other consumers and other systems at another, another time. You know, taking that attitude of build it and they will come that I'm going to build these data access or this, these web services that are going to provide some value and then it'll be ready when someone else needs to come and build it. As much as I love that old Kevin Costner movie, it's a very potentially wasteful way to build software. What happens is you end up very frequently building an API that doesn't meet the need of, of your eventual clients. Maybe they need they don't need some of the things you've already built, and they end up needing something slightly different, or they need to consume the data in a different way. So instead, we want to talk about pulling functionality and infrastructure as we need it. So if I'm picking up day one, we're building our first feature in an application. I want to only pull in the necessary bits of infrastructure, whatever data access I need right then and there. If there's a piece of security, security implementation that may be necessary, I think may be necessary for later features, don't worry about it right now. Only pull in what you need to do right now because there's always a possibility that you don't actually get around to building those later features. Only worry about a vertical pipe that's going to be actually deployable at first. So this idea, the, the saying, you aren't going to need it, or you aren't going to need it, you aren't going to need it, however you want to put it, um, ends up being the acronym YAGNI. So if you see, uh, you hear, ever hear anybody say, uh, let's just yag call YAGNI, let's just YAGNI that. It's giving you permission to move on. If you're talking about building out something for an edge case or a potential future use or a hook, hook in your system, because somebody might want to overload this later, or maybe they want to make this configurable, just call Yagni. There's a good chance that you won't need it later on. And even if you do, you could just add it when you need it later. Part of the idea here, the thinking behind this 
is the idea, and this, this is set forth in the very first extreme programming book from Kent Beck, is the idea that it doesn't hurt to throw away simple code. If you do something really simple now, and it turns out later you have to come back and make it more complicated or rewrite it when you know more, that doesn't hurt that much. If you build something complicated, changing something complicated is considerably harder. It's going to make you much less likely to throw it away even when you should. And then there's always the possibility that building something complicated, it's just gonna make the code harder to work with over time. You're making, you're purposely making a gamble here that by putting off complexity now, you're more likely to have been wrong about introducing the complexity than you will be to incur harm by not doing it earlier. Um, another way of, of something very closely related is the idea, and, and this is a do as I say, not as I do, because I don't perfectly follow this myself. Do the simplest thing that could possibly work. It, it's another way of kind of saying Yagni. Do what works today. Don't work, don't worry so much about edge cases that aren't actually going to happen or later use cases. Okay. And when we do this and do parse it, the, the word work at the end, it actually does matter. So that means it's fast enough, it's secure enough, it's logged well enough. It really does work. This is not an excuse to do sloppy work. It's just trying to rein you in from doing unnecessary work. Um, an extremely valuable idea uh, that I le first learned about in a, in a talk from Mary Poppendink about uh, lean programming um, is something called the last responsible moment. So the idea here is you want to make decisions as late as you can responsibly wait because the point at which that point, that is when you know the most about a problem. So I want you to think back of all the times you've designed a system and how many times you've gotten near the end of a system, the end of a project and said, gosh, I wish we had built it this totally other way. Knowing what we know now, we would have done this differently. As a matter of fact, it's one of the first questions I ask in any kind of software interview, interview is, tell me about something you wish you had done differently. And the underlying cause of that, of why you get to the end of the project and you say, damn, I wish we would have done this way a different way. It's because at that point, you know a lot more than you did when you probably got to make the decision in the first place. So the idea of the last responsible moment, it is trying to be very purposeful and intentful about deciding when you are going to make a decision. Um, for an example, from one of my current projects, uh, it's doing a lot of data access with Entity, frame, Entity Framework Core. And in, in a particular use case, uh, we're needing to grab data from you know, a main entity, and that main entity has an awfully lot of child entities and collections. And in a given use case, we need bits and pieces of this data all over the place. And of course, if you're listening to this, um, you're thinking, you know, this conference is sponsored by Couchbase. You should probably be using a document database that seems to fit your use case a lot better. That would be true. But we're still using EF Core for now. Um, today, to get this to the functionality up in place, we are very purposely doing the data access in a little bit of a naive way, and we're just grabbing every possible child object that we need to go. We know that's a potential performance problem. We have some ideas. Uh, they'll be much more complex in, in the implementation. But we have some ideas of how we may improve the performance uh, of that data access, which of course will be will be more complicated. Um, we're waiting until the hard numbers on performance tell us, yeah, that's too slow. And then we'll know to put that in. But then again, also at that time, we're gonna have a much better idea of how the system's used, what data is always going to be used versus what is sometimes going to be used. And we'll just know more. Okay. So this is also trying to get us around the idea of choosing a complicated 
technical direction up front that turns out to be wrong later. On the other side of it, responsible there matters, uh, not making a decision too late. Um, years ago, I was on a uh, um, medium-sized wind forms application, so heavy, heavy application that had a lot of logic about how you were allowed to change from one screen to another. Uh, did you have permission to go to this other screen? Did you still have unsaved work in screen A before you flipped over to screen B? Is there something invalid about screen B? Th that kind of thing. So <clears throat> we did this with one-off logic. We kind of saw it, and in retrospect, what we should have done, um, something called kind of a, I'd call a screen conductor pattern, which you can see today in some things like Prism or um, it's built into Angular, um, some other JavaScript script libraries. Um, we needed to introduce, and what we did end up later doing is we introduced an abstraction for the screen controllers that was more or less, can you leave? Can you, in, can you, can you start? Just a little bit of logic so that we were able to generalize the, uh, the infrastructure around transitioning from one page to another. Um, once we did that, the code was a lot cleaner. We were able to go and proceed and use more screens. But the point is, we waited too long to introduce that, that, uh, that abstraction, and it was much more work to retrofit that in to the existing code than it would have been if we'd made the decision earlier. Okay. It's also quite possible we probably shouldn't have introduced it too early, but we definitely waited too late. So last in putting things off, that matters too, but you cannot go past that responsible moment. All right. So a really important concept from design and how you're deciding about a technique or the tools you're going to use or even your process, this idea called reversibility. Um, so I'm going to read off, off the quote here. If you can easily change your decisions, this means that it's less important to get them right, which makes your life simpler. What that really means is um, even getting down into small, small decisions, we don't have to focus quite so hard on decisions where it's easier for us to change your mind later. Um, maybe it's easier to add fields later, um, easier to add some kind of functionality later. So I don't have to worry about it. But on the flip side, if a certain decision is hard to change later, that means we absolutely have to pay attention now and put some thought into it now. We might be wrong, but we still have to make the decision right now. So again, to that theme of deciding when to decide and being aware of what decisions have to be made when. Okay. I know this picture is a little bit blurry, uh, but what you're looking at here, and, and it looks like pretty wet concrete. So this is a slab floor. Say you're building a new house, and um, this is really common in Texas, not so much where I grew up, but this is a slab floor where you lay down concrete down below. What you see, those, those white pipes sticking up, those are PVC pipes. What you have to do in this case is you actually run all the piping up underneath of the foundation. So those pipes should all be in places where there's gonna be a kitchen sink or a bathroom, um, shower, wh wh whatever it's going to be. And I'm very purposely using this as a slide to demonstrate the idea of, of slow reversibility. Um, when I was a kid, in, when I was in high school and college, I worked for my father with his uh, construction crew. And one year in the absolute hottest, most humid July you can possibly imagine, uh, we watched these poor plumbers. Uh, in this massive house, they put the pipes for the bathroom in the wrong place. Um, I think they misread read the blueprint. So these two poor guys come out, and what you had to do is you have to bring out this giant concrete saw. And it's like a two-man rig of one guy holding it, just barely being able to hold this giant saw, and another guy pouring water over it. So I have to cut the concrete out, dig all the concrete out, move the pipes around, and pour all new concrete on, down below it uh, to get it started. 
And of course, you know how the story is going to go. They got it wrong the second time. <laughs> they had to come back a, a week later and they just looked miserable. <laughs> right. And, and I know I shouldn't make fun of them, but it was hilarious at the time. Um, so what we need to get out of this is there are some decisions where you just can't change your mind and you got to pay a lot more attention to getting them them right. You got to double check your blueprints, you got to measure things twice. You got to be a lot more careful. So I want to talk about some incidents, some examples of low and high reversibility. So some other things to think about. If you are doing an integration with a system uh, that's maybe owned by another organization, maybe a third party, third party vendor, um, the team of old COBOL mainframe developers that works in the basement, whoever they are, somebody, if you're working with an external group that has a very inflexible flexible calendar, you're going to have to probably agree on things early on. You, you have to put more, more thought up front. You got to choose things earlier. Uh, maybe things like choosing a client technology, you know, and this is, this is maybe easier than it used to be, but kind of need to decide if something is going to be a native desktop application or a mobile application. I probably need to know that a little closer to up front. That's not something that's real easy to turn on a dime, right? My one and only experience with the startup, um, tried to, try to change from a desktop application to a tablet application to a native mobile application and nothing ever got delivered. So, um, some things, basic code organization strategies. And here I just mean, what's your paradigm? Are you going to be using MVC? Are you going to be using a hexagonal architecture? Um, I don't really think those are that stressful because there aren't that many permutations to choose from, but those are decisions that are hard to change your mind up front. Okay. And of course people do this all the time, but it's not going to be that easy to start in C sharp and decide tomorrow. No, we need to rewrite everything in rust or Golang or whatever it's going to be. Now, being more positive. And I would say you, you take the quality of reversibility and you purposely use this in how you choose the tools you're gonna use. Because some things are gonna give you more reversibility than others. I'm just giving you some more examples. And of course, just generically modular code. Code that's well-structured, good names, um, things that shouldn't be related or loosely coupled from each other. That code is just naturally gonna be easier to work with and change. Um, having very effective automated test coverage. Um, I, I would tell you the single most important thing for continuous design is probably just having a solid feedback loop of automated tests, unit tests, integration tests, whatever it needs to be, so that it's safe to go make changes later. Let me do something simple now. If I need to do something more complicated with, with performance or security later, as long as I have tests, I can do that. Um, some examples just from technology, and these are just things I pulled off the top of my head. Um, I'm a big fan of the Russian doll model of you're just thinking, uh, in this case, uh, ASP.NET Core, the middleware strategy. You know, in my controller, I could have middleware around that that's handling transaction mechanics. I could have middleware outside of that that is doing uh, logging for me. I could definitely have security. That kind of middleware enables me to put some cross-cutting concerns. Um, taking again the example of security or, or logging, by being able to just add middleware around my code later, I can work on, on the base, baseline functionality and not have to think about all those other variables because I can easily change my mind and wrap those later with, with extra middleware to take care of those. Um, I would say that is a very solid reason to choose to move up to ASP.NET Core versus uh, more classic ASP.NET and VC. I know you had action filters, but I don't think they're as good. Um, core gives you better, better reversibility. Uh, you know, one, because of the middleware, and then also because Core, I think, is much more testable. Um, you know, again, to, to our sponsors here, um, things like Couchbase or the Martin project that I work on. Um, I'm a big believer in document databases. In this case, what I really just mean is 
an object that you're trying to persist, instead of having to individually map it to different fields and tables in a relational database, the document database probably just serializes the JSON and deals with it very easily. Um, I'm a big believer in document databases. I think it's a lot less friction. I think they are much more accommodating of changing your domain model and, and your approach. I think it's a lot less work to deal with database migrations. That I would say, when I'm asked, when I'm asked why would you recommend a document database or why do you try to use them? I would say it's because of reversibility. It makes it easier to do continuous design. Okay. So a big important part of making continuous design feasible, it is that test coverage. And the best way to get the test coverage, in my opinion, is test-driven development and or behavior-driven development. Um, and these two things are not necessarily about the test coverage because it's really about, TDD was really meant to be about design. Um, but it's more likely to leave you with um, a, an effective safety net of automated tests as opposed to trying to write code and then later on retrofit some tests behind it. The writing tests later, it, it just never seems to work out as well. You miss a lot of things. But what's important here is that first word up there, testability. And testability, is almost a stand-in, in a lot of cases, is almost a stand-in for modularity, the qualities of code that we want anyway. Thinking through testability as a heuristic, as a tool to, to think through what is good or what not, by trying to do tests as we go or as early as possible, it forces us to think about the structure of an application or structure of individual classes, methods, inputs. Um, your unit testing is just not going to be efficient unless you really are breaking things into small, small bites. Coupling, um, tight coupling will, will seriously impede your ability to write tests. So it forces you, I think it can, it forces you to write better code. But what I would hope at a minimum is, it's a way to think through how your code should be structured. Um, having the tests and the testability, it's obviously going to improve reversibility, which makes continuous design work as a whole. Okay. Now, talking about some ideas of what testability is. So, long time ago, when I was learning test driven development in the previous decade, well, two, pre two decades ago, uh, I wrote a series of blog posts. Uh, I kind of jokingly called Jeremy's Laws of TDD Design. And you see the first four there. And those four are being the only ones I ever got around writing. Um, on the left, this is a system I've been working and helping a client with for about two years. Um, this is a little subsystem you're seeing on the left slide there. So this is about routing how a payment when a customer is making a payment toward their loan, how is the money being routed? How much is applying, how much of, let's say a customer makes a thousand dollar payment to their loan. How much of that thousand dollars should go to principal? How much should go to interest payments? Um, is it a valid payment? Is something wrong with the loan to begin with? Is it referring to an invalid loan number? Um, do they have fees? Are they paying things? Is it okay for them to pay principal early? Are they not? So on and so forth. And to make that more complicated, um, you could be making payments that span several months. Maybe you're late. There's just a, an astonishing number of business rules here. Now, those business rules are fed by data from a lot of external sources. It's being fed by... Um, there's some flags coming from a configuration file. There's some data we need to go look up in this parameters database off to the side, things about individual loans. Um, there's a big, very extremely complicated third-party application that's very difficult to work with. So it has a lot of this information that we need to get to upfront to do validation and routing, but also this is what's gonna receive the results of what we're routing later. 
Okay. Now, let's say the testability is we are trying to do agile. We're trying to test as we go, we're trying to create a good system. So we're using testability to try to decide how this thing should be split up. So let's go through these four bullet points. You know, the first one, isolate the ugly stuff, right? So let's talk about the things that are too hard to test. It's going to come up that there are some elements of your code, maybe things that deal with cryptography, calling external services, elements of your code that are probably going to be too hard or too expensive to automate tests. So what you try to do is to take those things away and kind of isolate them up and keep them away from the rest of your application so that you can test most of the application. So in this case, what we want to do, take this third-party application, I want it off the site. I'm going to put some kind of service gateway layer in front of it that is going to deal with everything hard about putting data in or interpreting it. But more importantly, I'm going to take this routing logic. And let's pull this all the way off to the side. We say the payment routing logic, say, hang on a second. Um, Christopher, I think something's coming in the chat, but gotcha. Sorry, Christopher. <clears throat> So the biggest thing here is the second bullet point. We're gonna push, don't pull. I do not want this routing logic, the code that's doing the routing logic, to have to stop what it's doing in the middle and go reach out and try to grab something from somewhere else. What I want instead is want everything about this business logic, the business logic that's gonna change a lot, that's gonna have a lot of permutations. I want all inputs to the thing to be pushed into it. So what I do is I make this thing passive. This place where I have most of the test cases. So I divide something else up, some kind of mediator, or controller, or, or conductor that's going to be responsible for reaching out, getting what's necessary, and then pushes it to this passive payment routing logic. So push, don't pull. Um, don't make the, the business logic have to reach out. Just give it everything you want. This is a form of inversion of control. Okay. Uh, test small before testing big. In reality, this system was not necessarily put together the way that I'm showing it here. And it had to depend on a lot of end-to-end -end manual testing of, and I won't get into the details, but the problem by doing that is your, the amount of space and surface area that you have to cover when something is wrong is immense. It could be wrong in any place. We don't know if any, some parts of it were unit tested well ahead of time, but we didn't necessarily know when something blew up, there wasn't an automatic, aha, it's here. What I mean by test small before testing big is looking over here, I'm gonna write a whole lot of unit tests against the payment routing logic, where I just feed data into it and see what's coming out. Um, I am probably gonna test the service layer piece I am probably going to try to write more middle integration. Is it able to read its configuration file? Is it able to go and pick out what it's supposed to from this database? And God help us all. Is it able, forget everything that's going on over here, is it able to talk to this third-party application correctly? I want to make sure those smaller tasks work before I try to put the rest of it together. I am probably also going to come into this mediator level and I'm probably going to have to use mock objects or stubs to stand in for this guy over here. But I'm going to make sure that this thing is really able to do the go-between logic. Once all these boxes work independently, and I'm relatively sure they work independently, then I'm going to worry about doing some bigger, broader, coarser grain tests around all of these things. Um, now, you might have spec those things out with BDD tests, but as far as trying to make them pass, I want the little things to pass first and then put it all together. What you're trying to do there is you're trying to avoid massive debugging cycles. So one of the things I, I, I've been taught over the years, and I've definitely observed myself, is pay attention to how much time you're spending in a debugger. And if you're spending a lot of time in a debugger to make code work, 
you probably need to adjust the way you're testing. Uh, in all likelihood, you're probably depending too much on coarse grain tests. You maybe need to introduce more fine grain unit tests to keep that debugger down. And this is on the idea that it's less expensive to work through smaller tests than it is to spend a lot of time in a debugger. And then finally, um, I call it avoid, a long, avoid the long tail. This is really talking about dependencies. Another way I, I've heard this said by, by other people. So again, talking about this payment routing logic. This is like the rock star in this system. This is the most important thing out of all this. Because if this is wrong, money's going the wrong place. And money's pretty important in this case, right? So think of it, taking it this way. If I want to write unit tests against this payment routing logic so that I can very quickly change the routing logic when new products are in, put in place, maybe regulations change, who knows what it is. Um, if I take this payment routing logic off the shelf and I want to start writing unit tests for it, how much other stuff do I have to pull with it, right? Do I have to pull... Uh, configuration files? Do I have to pull a database? Do I have to pull in this whole third-party application? And if you have to pull a lot more stuff in, that's a lot more stuff to set up, it's a lot more stuff to initialize. Your tests are going to run slower. It's going to be hard, just more work for you to write. So this is another thing to think about. Keeping your logic, especially anything that's going to change a lot or have a lot of permutations of inputs and outputs, keep that isolated from everything else around it. So it's easier to work with just that, okay? Um, another concrete example I've seen in the past, uh, worked with the system you, um, with a client years ago as a consultant that um, had a, had a what, what I was told um, and looked like it, uh, this really awesome uh, pricing system, pricing engine to uh, price out inter potential energy trades. Right. Um, and they had an op they thought they had a big business opportunity to adapt this business rule for to be more what if kind of kind of solutions. You know, maybe you had a spreadsheet and you typed in, well, if the price of uh, West Texas Intermediate dropped to this much a barrel, how much could I make by doing this? And it was an awesome business opportunity, they thought. But the problem was this testing, this pricing engine was very tightly coupled to the proprietary database and, and its specific structure. There was no easy way to use the, um, the pricing engine without bringing all this other stuff in. So in that case, they missed out. Not only was this thing harder to test, and it was, but they also missed out on potential business opportunity because it was too tightly coupled. So think about that. We're down to five minutes. Let me get down to the last couple of things. So turbo refactoring, um, it's used a lot. What it really means is a discipline technique for making incremental improvements to existing code without changing behavior. Way, the formal way of being a little more specific, I'm working from within tests. I'm making very small changes. I'm renaming something, I'm abstracting it out, but I'm always, what rerunning these tests and I'm making sure in a disciplined way that I am not breaking the functionality of the code. This word has kind of gotten misused a little bit to mean any possible change to the system or restructuring. So down below, um, so I grew up in Missouri and just about the only famous Missourian of all time is, is Mark Twain. So we all know the famous quote, lies, damn lies and statistics. Well, as a software developer, it's lies, damn lies, and it's just, it's just, some, just some refactoring, right? That's generally a lie. When you say that, you really could mean anything. You could be redesigning the whole system, and you're purposely telling somebody some lullaby language to make them, to make them fall asleep and not worry too much about what you said. But what you really said is, we're going to restructure and change everything, okay? So it's just a personal pet peeve. Um, I've used it myself too, but it's wrong. We shouldn't do this. Okay, with a couple minutes up, um, I'm gonna skip ahead to the last couple things. Um, when you're thinking about how to start 
start a big complicated task. One of the problems here is you can be kind of frozen in fear of, I, I don't understand how everything is possibly going to work together. How can I get started? So two ways to approach it. And it depends on, it depends on the way you're doing it. You can start with the top level workflow of I'm going to start designing the main flow of the application. And maybe I don't understand some steps and I'll just put placeholders in. In this case, I could be designing with stubs or stand-ins. This is like starting as a client and just writing in a stub for whatever service should be. Or instead, what I could do is I could start from the bottom up and I could say, I'm going to write some individual tasks, you know, transforming a piece of data, making a certain calculation, um, and then kind of building little Lego pieces and stacking those together in whatever the final structure is going to be when you understand it. And what I would tell you, it's not always do one or the other. You start with what you understand how to do. If you understand tasks, but not the workflow, you go bottom up. You assemble some pieces, working pieces together that are hopefully very decoupled from each other. And what happens frequently is that suggests a workflow of how these things should be glued together later, hopefully. If you understand the workflow, but you don't understand individual steps, Maybe you start top down. You start with the main main processor or controller that's calling out to someone else. Maybe you use this as a way to design the exact signature that a service is going to need to be by starting with the client instead of the service. And lastly, um, last thing I want to talk about is just getting into the softer side of things, the process stuff. So. I don't know that it's a great movie, but I love Starship Troopers back in the day. And there's this really famous scene in it. Um, the new lieutenant comes through. I only have one rule. Everybody fights, no one quits. So just in terms of your software team makeup, every single person on that team, every developer, every architect, maybe even some testers, needs to be involved in the software design. Maybe you're not contributing the same way, but the things that need to be happen, happening is, the folks that are a little more senior you need to be working to constantly socialize design. Um, as your design is changing or as you, as the team is figuring out how to do things, always be talking to everybody on the team, make sure everybody understands what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're adding, what we're changing about our design approach and why we are doing this. So they understand, have a better idea of when to follow it. On the flip side of that, Every developer, no matter how strong or weak they happen to be in software design, can at least tell you, is this working out or not? Your very most junior developer is, should be capable of, of recognizing, this seems like it's harder than it should be. Are you sure there's not another way to do this? And if, if you're part of the technical leadership, you need to pay attention to that. Um, this is something I've learned doing a lot of, a lot of infrastructure for other teams. You need to pay attention to what they're telling you about the tools and constantly adapting. So on that, I hope this talk was worthwhile. Um, I hope this will encourage maybe some folks that aren't familiar with it to maybe go turn back the page and look just a little bit at extreme programming. And I think we are done.